What's up and welcome to Ahead of the Curve. This is your host, Jonathan Gellner, and thank you so much for joining us today. This podcast is powered by Stick and Ball TV, the baseball and softball streaming platform. If you haven't checked it out already, there are hundreds of videos and so much great content just waiting for you. And the cool part? It's all updated weekly. Check it out at stickandball.tv or on the Stick and Ball TV mobile app. On today's show, we have on Ryan Harrison. Ryan has a degree in exercise physiology from the University of California at Davis, and he has worked on improving athletes' visual performance on the field since 1999. Through the years, he has worked with hundreds of baseball stars. He has also worked with the 2010, 2012, and 2014 World Series champion San Francisco Giants, but also the Toronto Blue Jays and the Philadelphia Phillies as well as nine other professional baseball organizations. Collegiately, he has worked with the 2016 NCAA champion, Coastal Carolina, the 2012 champion, Arizona Wildcats, and the 2013 champions in the UCLA Bruins, as well as Oregon State, Wichita State, Kentucky, and Long Beach State. Ryan also works with many collegiate softball programs as well. So on the show, we discuss several drills that you can take and implement in practice tomorrow. We talk balance, depth perception, and one of my favorite discussions was over when, where, and how to look. Here is Ryan Harrison. Ryan, welcome to Ahead of the Curve. Thanks for uh, having me on, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Of course, of course. So uh, one of the things that, that I mentioned to you just a minute ago was this is this vision is an area that I'm really starting to get into. And it's been one of the things that I've started to do more research lately and started to really dig into to how we can help players see better. And so that leads me to you because I know that you and Dr. Bill uh, have built the company and, and to what it is today. And, and you, one, your company is called Slow the Game Down. And so you guys are, are one of the best resources on the internet for just finding out information for vision and helping players see better with baseball and I'm sure softball specifically. But I want to know, so let's say that I am, uh, I'm in charge of, a, of an organization, let's say, you know, college age kids or high school kids. And I wanted you to come in and I just said, hey, Ryan, I'm going to give you full reign to do whatever you feel is most useful so if I hired you tomorrow and you were coming to Tulsa to help our players, where would we start? It's a good question, Jonathan. I think that's uh, uh, you know, a question a lot of people have is where do I start? And when you think about vision, um, it's so important to this game, but it's really the most um, under-taught, under-thought about uh, process to it. We spend so much time on the mechanics, the mental, and those are all, all good but we forget about how the visual system works and, and do it. And, you know, there's a lot of easy things to, to implement and there can be some challenging stuff. So when you ask me, where do we start? Obviously, um, the first start is you want players with two eyes, right? We want to make sure that they have two eyes to be able to track the ball more efficiently. But how those eyes function is the key component. So when, when I'm in, I'm not an optometrist, my father was an optometrist, my sister's an optometrist, but I come in and I evaluate the visual system. Now, it's not about seeing 2015, 2010, uh, 2040, but it is something that we do look for to, to make sure that they do have the, the clarity to be able to do the task at hand. Um, but it's really about how the brain uses the two eyes to allow themselves to perform, whether it's depth perception, speed of recognition, speed of processing, visual recognition, uh, visual aiming, uh, a lot of different skill sets that are in there. And so when working with a program, we will go in and we will evaluate different visual skills to see um, where the players are and then understand what we need to work on for each player. Now, that's a little bit of a higher end side of things Mm -hmm. with players. On the outside of that, it's really about how how they train it. So even if there are some skills that, you know, let's say in that team situation, you got one that's got really good depth perception, you got eight kids who don't and two kids that are really, really, really struggle with with depth perception. 
um, you know, we design a program that every single one of those players can benefit from. Uh, and the, obviously the people with better skills, it's going to be easier. And the people with tougher skills, it's going to be a little bit more challenge. After going through some of these skill training, it's really about technique and tactical aspect of the vision. So you can have great eyes, great clarity, great visual skills, but do you know when to look, where to look, and how to look? Uh, mm -hmm. How do you control that visual system? And you know, you know, given a, a simple example, it, and I, I give this a lot of times, but we've all taken a book, whether it was school, whether just for fun, and we take it and we start looking at it and we read a few pages. And if I took a, a analysis and took a video camera. We'll see the eyes move, but after about you know a couple of pages, you say, "What the heck did I just read?" And this is what makes it really tough for coaches: is they look at a person, they say his eyes are aimed in the right spot or seem to be aimed in the right spot, but he's not visually processing what's going on. So it, it's more than just you know, and I hear this all the time: uh, different levels of play. Well, he's had his eyes checked. Well, it, right. I, I might, that's a piece of the pie, <laughs> you know, let's, it's, it, the visual system is not a, a simple pill that's going to make them great, but it's actually visual habits and visual cognition and understanding of how to use their eyes to perform. Wow. There's just, there's so much to unpack there, which I'm really excited to dig in with that. Uh, I did. I did have a question, and this isn't coming from a place of bias or anything. But whenever you talked about depth, depth perception, and uh, and some some of those different areas with clarity, and I'm sure that the speed of uh, recognizing speed and th different things like that, I actually got to take the S two cognition test. Is there mm -hmm. uh, just in your opinion? Is there value in that uh, that translates directly to baseball? Is it just kind of an evaluation? Uh, tactic, and I don't know what your opinions are, and so if if you're if you love it or if you're completely against it, I you know we I have no bias here, but it was yeah, something well, that really caught my well, interest with it. Yeah, the truth is, I've never taken the S two cognition. I do know the people there, including uh, Paul Phillips, and uh, Paul was a disciple of of my of us. Um, trained him as a player. Oh, cool. Um, a, as well as a coach, and I still have long discussions with them. Um, uh, very long discussions with them and um, knowing some of the results out of the S2 cognition, uh, they have a very good testing protocol to understand different brain functions. The, the challenge now is, okay, now that we know this, how do we coach them up uh, around these different things? And, sure. and our belief is that the visual system is malleable, just like the brain is malleable. The eyes are actually part of the brain. And so what do we do if we know those things, what can we do to enhance them or, or use them um, as a tool? So for instance, uh, we have a, a testing uh, product that tests um, eye movements and it's unique. Uh, no one else has this in the sports world, but it tells us um, how quick the eyes move, how fast the eyes are, how well they track an object, uh, a bunch of different things. And some of those tests actually correlates to the S2 cognition tests as well. There's similar processes that are testing. And when we know some of these things, like for instance, let's say, Jonathan, you have a uh, slow latency. Okay. Now latency and the best way to describe this is if you're at a red light and the light turns green, how quick does it take you to start? Right. Okay. And, um, if, you, if you're a naturally slow, latent person, then you probably have to be better on the technical standpoint of making sure your eyes are in the right place at the right time. Whether it's, it, you know, because latency is actually a hard skill to improve unless there's some like concussion or, or something else going on. Now, if you have a quick latency, that means you can afford, um, ver you know, being... And I'll say this simply, but late with your eyes to get there. On, okay. uh, you understand what I mean? So mm -hmm. having some of that information is great because it helps. If it's not, if it's a skill that can't be trained, or if it's a skill that we cannot clean up, then we know it, and then we know how to use our tactics to to bypass that issue. 
No, I really like that. And and I love getting to hear, <laughs> again, you work through that process too, which is, which is really interesting for me because I feel like most coaches have had, you know, player X, Y, or Z who's five o'clock hitter and you watch him take BP and you're like, holy crap, he's going to be the next Albert Pujols. And then they get to the game, but you see all of this potential. And for me, thinking back, I always was like, well, it must be a swing issue and, or, you know, they've just, to use the example you used earlier, they must not be able to see well, they need to get their eyes checked. And so one of the questions that I have too, and and it could be, you know, one or all of the things that we're going to talk about today, but what different problems do players have that are innate and can't be fixed and versus the ones that you mentioned that the brain is malleable, which is, I think, one of the coolest discoveries uh, in the history of our world that we can change the brain. But what what can they change and what can't? <laughs> that's a that's a huge question you're asking me. Um, right? Okay. Okay. But um, but it, it's a good one too because you're right. What can and can't be changed? And you know, let me simplify a little bit. Obviously, clarity is something that can be changed by glasses, contact lens, even surgery. Um, okay. And that depends on a lot of you know variables as well. So that's why I kind of compartmentalized the clarity medical side. Um, From a skill wise, uh, a lot of, you know, skills can be cleaned up. Uh, There's 14 muscles in the eye, seven in each eye, 12 that are involved in tracking a ball. And those 12 muscles, uh, whether they're innate, uh, whether it's, you know, um, you know, injury, whatever it is, they can be very tight. And if those muscles are tight, they don't track an, a moving object very well. So that has to do with um, how binocularity and how the brain uses both eyes and how it fires these muscles. Those are all trainable skills. And I can tell you that um, naturally not a lot of people have that skill. I can tell you some guys, uh, professional hitters that do have it uh, naturally. Uh, Barry Bonds was one of them. Um, I can tell you... Um, um, Tommy Lastella uh, is one that more recent that has very high level depth perception. And then there are guys who are, who have trained it to, to be at a higher level. Um, JD Martinez is one who's trained that I know has trained it. Um, Sean Casey was one that I've worked with a lot that that's trained it. Um, I can go through a huge list of different players who have trained sure. it to get a high level mm-hmm. level. And what they get out of that side of training is, Sometimes they don't know what they did. It's just basically they've gotten the eye muscles to work better and the ball and the ball looks like a beach ball. And so they say, I don't know what it's doing for me, but I see it so good. I'm not going to change. <laughs> now, there are some things that you can, like I said, you can have some of these great skills, but there are some people that have uh, just a, a, a challenge of focusing. And you hear that all the time. They either their eyes don't stay still or their their mind wanders. Um, and so there's tactical ways of if you have someone that has that those issues, we got to figure out how to harness it so that they can control it when they need to control it. And, you know, in my bias, let's say the mental side, well, you know, take a deep breath, all these great things. They're wonderful. But if their eyes aren't aimed in the right place, it doesn't matter how many deep breaths you take or how confident you think you are. You don't give yourself a chance to be successful. And that's what we're trying to do. What I look at is, you know, whether, whether it's baseball, softball, any sport, you got these two eyes. We want them aiming at an object, knowing what that object needs to be. Obviously, in this game, it's the ball. And how do, do they aim accurately together and do they track well and then how does that affect my mindset and my swing? So if I can see things really well and have the confidence of seeing things well, my mentality is going to be pretty good. And as long as I know how to swing, I'll be pretty pretty decent. Now, I do think mm-hmm. mechanics are important. you got to have good swing because, you know, I, um, just because you have great eyes and you have an um, okay swing, it may not be good enough. But if we can get everything working really well, now, now we got an athlete performing at a high level. Finally, to, finally, to machine is what I like. No, I love it. I love it. No, that's great. And I, I think it goes back to <clears throat> whenever I was growing up. 
little people like not little people, but very few people talked about like hitting mechanics and it was, you know, it was before video on your iPhone. And so that's, that was my bias whenever I started coaching because it was something that I never really got. And so they had always just say, you know, if you can't see it, you can't hit it. And it's funny because I think we all go through just cyclical things of figuring out what's important to us, what we want to teach and what we actually think is going to translate to players. And so it's funny that I come back to, okay, finally I'm back to a place where I'm like, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where we've got to start, which I think is, is really, it's, it's just kind of funny to me to think about, to think back to it. But you did say three different things that I want to dig into a little bit more. You talked about when to look, where to look and how to look. And I don't, I don't, I, we can go in that order if you want, but I'd love to, for you to go a little bit more in depth with how you would teach that if, if I was coming to you and we were going over uh, something similar. Yeah. So, you know, Jonathan, you might have to, to, to keep steering me into this right direction on here, but I want okay. you to think about this. And when we talk about when, where, and how, um, you know, the first thought, and this kind of goes into everything, especially from a coaching standpoint, but I do tell these, these players as well as coaches, but players, you know, first of all, I ask them how many uh, plate appearances they get a year. Now mm-hmm. we're talking different levels, but let's talk softball for a minute. If okay. I, if we're talking about a healthy year, not, not in this pandemic time program. When I ask the softball girl, how many games a year they play or how many weekends a year they play, they'll say every weekend. So well, we kind of dumb it down and say, well, let's say, uh, you know, 40 weekends. And how many games a weekend? They're going to play three to five games. And if we just went with three games, that's 120 games that they're going to have in a year. And of those 120 games, they're going to get about 300 bats. Or I mean, three bats per, per game. So, sorry, it's 360 um, plate appearances that they get. Now, a major leaguer is going to get about 600 plate appearances. And so I'm going to use a, a major leaguer number, and you can all think about your numbers in, in a year. But of 600, they get an average of about 3.8 pitches per at bat. So if I went with four, that's 2,400 pitches. And they swing about 45% of the time, which we'll say half. They swing 1,200 times. What percentage of those 1,200 swings, Jonathan, do you think are perfect mechanics? Very few. (laughs) I'll, I'll give myself an out and say not very many. Yeah, and that's what they'll say, and especially, you know, like you said, as times have changed, we got all this technology that we can, we can, um, you know, find something wrong with every single swing if we really wanted mm-hmm. to. Yet these players are trying to be perfect in their swing, yet it's rare that it happens in game time. And you still have to be good, like I said, but what I look at, of those 2,400 pitches, how well did you see the ball? And that's a hard answer Except for one answer that people can uh, always understand. When you have the take sign, how good does that ball look? Mm-hmm. They all yep. say they get mad. It's It was the best pitch they saw. Mm-hmm. And what we want to see is what if you could see 10% of those pitches like that better? You know, what if you could see 240 pitches like that? How good would you be? And that's one pitch per game. And if you saw one pitch per bat, which is 600, how good would you be? And so that's kind of the the philosophy is we got to go from, hey, what's this task of how do I see the ball? Not just look at it, but how do I see it? How do I get my eyes aimed in the right place? You know, uh, when, do, like I said, when do we get there? Where do we get there? And, and how do we get there is, is really breaking it down to the task. And the task is um, to see the ball the best they can and make solid contact or take the pitch properly. And if they do that on all 2,400 pitches, they give themselves a great opportunity to be successful. And so again, okay, great. So see the ball the best I can. How can, how do I know what I see or how do I get there? Mm -hmm. And part of it is a longer process that we won't have time to go through everything, but it's really, what I go through in a teaching standpoint is I show them how their eyes work for them and how they work against them and how, you know, people think we see a lot of information, but it's a very small, about 5% view of clarity. The rest of it, we see color, we see motion, 
And that's fine for, for most of things we're doing, but we don't see, we only see that detail in that 5%. Sure. So if we have one eye looking in that spot, we'll see, but we may not see, uh, we, we may, our brain may not be getting enough information. So we want both eyes, like two video cameras, aiming at this object. And now our brain is understanding, and I call it sucking in the information uh, of where things are in space better. But if that aim is off by, you know, a certain percentage or by by a few inches, to be honest with you, or by a foot, um, you're not getting the clarity of information that's needed to be to be able to read that. And so, a lot of players, when I ask them when a pitcher gets on the mound and they step in the box, what do they look at? And most of them go, uh, look at his eyes, or I'm just mm-hmm. looking I'm just looking out there. Okay, mm-hmm. now now the pitcher strides. Where are you looking? Um, I I don't know. You know. Okay, now I'm turning. Uh, where are you looking? I don't know. Now the hands break. Where are you looking? I think the ball. Okay, now the ball's coming out of the release point. Where are you looking? I don't know. Some, somewhere near there. They don't really have a visual plan of how to get their eyes to the right spot at the right time. So one is learning. You know, obviously with with professional. You have a lot of video and data that you can find out where this guy's release point or average release point is. Um, but you can even do it by sitting in the dugout bullpen, you know, watching guys' release points and understanding really where these guys are are releasing the ball. And then working on a methodology of getting your eyes to that release point. Uh, and prior to that is making sure your eyes are right to be able to do it. And then – as important as early recognition, which a lot of people talk about, to me, Jonathan, is the easiest thing to do. It's the late recognition that people fail at. Okay. And if you think about that, that early and late is a certain amount of time. And if you've shortened either one of those or inaccurate in any one of those, you just sped the game up. And that's why we talk about slowing the game down is giving your eyes the most amount of time to process that visual information to allow your body to do what it needs to do. No, that's great. And I, I love, I love again, hearing you work through this process because it's not, and it's not an easy thing to do. And so even though you say when, where, and how in those three words, it's like, okay, there's so much depth that goes into that, which I think is really, really good. And so one of the things that, that I've, again, recently discovered is your setup can either help or hinder your line of sight and your vision. And one of the things that I, that I came across was what you mentioned, which is you, we really only have like a five degree, maybe, and you correct me if I'm wrong with this, like a five degree radius with the front of our eyes, like looking directly forward and then it gets hazy you see motion and although our eyes are moving back and forth and and reading information we don't have clarity on that and so just making sure that both eyes are looking to where we want them to look and how uh, just gives our us the best chance to be able to to see the ball early and slow the game down and so that that's just something that that i think uh, again with with setup and so whenever you are setting guys up talking mechanics what are some different things that you see that hinders that besides, you know, not having two eyes? I, I, for me, I think getting guys to relax and to not be just so tense because I think tense can affect the field of vision. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, Jonathan, the hardest thing is for a coach to understand what, what the heck is going on with this guy's eyes. Um, and, you know, there are some things that are higher level, uh, but on a basic level, making sure their eyes are in the right spot. And if they're not, as far as a setup, you know, we need to find out why. And um, there are some things that that happen, one, with the eye muscles, like I mentioned earlier, or maybe how the brain uses the eyes. Um, we call it like sensory or, or uh, the visual processing. That actually is a reason why a hitter will set up a certain way. Um and it's not always in the old days, you know, and I know people still talk about this. Well, it's the dominant eye. Let's get the dominant eye set up right. That's not, nece- that's not necessarily the best thing to do. Okay. It plays a role, but it's not the reason why I would change or move someone until I knew more about his eyes to do that. 
what we really want them to do is make sure that, yeah, their eyes are in a good position, you know, not knowing the, 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 you know, the physiology or the physics that are going on with that person's eyes. We want to make sure we set them in a comfortable position to get both eyes at the release point if we can. Now okay. you, you mentioned this fatigue issue or, um, the, um, I forget what you, how you said it, but like the, the 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 stress, the like just a really tense looking, yep. you know, you know, like they're they they've got the bat in their hands and they're just so tense, and it's just like ah, oh, dude, you, like just relax so you can see, it, so you can yeah. see it. So it, it, tell me, there's some tell me there's some methodology behind that because I've been teaching that for a long time. Well, there is. So relaxed eyes are better eyes. Okay, so um, you know I, one of my favorite quotes was by Tony Gwynn. Uh, I watched him, I was at a dinner where he was talking and he said, you can't hit with a tight booty. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, oh, that's good on so many levels. Yeah. You can't, you can't, you know, squeeze your, your, your butt cheeks and try to swing. It won't happen. And that's the same thing kind of with the eyes. It's like, you know, we want them, the more relaxed they are, the better they react. And so, you know, it, it, it all works together, which is so cool. Um, and, you know, uh, this is maybe a little bit off here, but I've seen this where we get their visual system in a relaxed state. Uh, we get them aiming in the right spot like we're talking about. We have the brain using both eyes. Swing gets better because they're not worried about the swing. And and this this kind of goes to with, with what you said there is when athletes are at their best, they see things really well. They don't think and they don't feel. When they struggle, they feel too much. They think too much and they don't see very well. Mm. And so in my mind, if we control the visual system, they get less of that stress, fatigue, thinking, um, including, and this is a little bit over the top and may not, you know, people may not understand this completely, but um, there's a part of the brain called the amygdala that has to do with the fear factor part of the brain, the stress, mm-hmm. you know, fight or flight. And there is some research that talks about how eye movements can con- control the level of anxiety in the amygdala. And so that's something that, that we've talked, you know, from as far as I remember with my father is how, how controlling these eye movements. And we, I never understood the science till more recently is how it's calming that brain and getting them that heightened visual awareness and a calm focused state. Sure. And again, with, uh, since, since I'm not a brain scientist either, whenever mm-hmm. our eyes are moving rapidly, it's starting to trigger that because, you know, our, our tribal mentality and our evolution over time, whenever we were hunters and gatherers, whenever we were in a bad state and we were, that's kind of how it was working. Same thing with like breathing, breathing through your nose is, is a luxury is what some people say. So whenever we're breathing through our mouths all the time, that was usually when we were in a state of panic, which is really interesting. And so I, I love that you brought that up. And uh, another thing we see a lot, especially with amateur players is I don't, I don't know where this starts, but it, for me, it was, it's kind of hard to fix was like the, the lean, I'm, I'm going to just describe this best I can. And maybe you can see it in your head, but like the leaned over, let like for a righty hitter, the left eye like higher up than the right eye, so they're they're almost like their neck is leaned over, or then yeah. then whenever they swing or and that's in the setup, and then whenever they or some hitters swing, they get that like side lean like to whatever yeah. side that they're that they're swinging with, and they start to lean over. One, tell us how that affects vision, <laughs> and then two, how do we fix it? Well, first of all, you have zero depth perception when you get into that that mode now so we want level eyes for depth perception yeah now let me backtrack that i should say you have zero depth perception but you don't have working depth perception and i i I don't want to get too scientific in here but if i lost my eye today i would still have some depth perception based off awareness um you know human nature and my brain function but i really won't have like high definition depth perception because Got I'm it. only getting information. So kind of in that, in that side, when a hitter tilts that head, which they think they're getting behind the ball, uh, which is not necessarily right. 
is their eyes are tilting and their brain is going, uh Oh, I'm falling. And mm-hmm. the, in yeah. a sense, the energy kind of goes away from the eyes, but also the eyes don't work up and down They're side to side for a reason. And that's how they work best. And so we lose a lot of our binocularity as well as seeing uh, uh, movement in, in that mode. So how do we fix it? Um, you know, there, there's a few different ways um, that we do. And um, one of them is when we train depth perception, we show our athletes how if their head changes, they can't do the depth perception training. So part of it's awareness mm-hmm. of understanding what happens. Um, the second part is is really about, um, you know, how they see the ball through contact and um, having that visual awareness of their, their, their position in there. There are some things sometimes I'll use. Um, I have some lasers that um, go on a headband and we can put two lasers uh, one on the you know above the left ear, one above the right ear, and we'll put it you know facing a wall, and they work on their swing, and they can see how much head movement they really have by seeing how these two lasers come off of plane in a sense, and so it gives it's a good feedback to these guys because you tell them hey keep your eyes up, I am I am <laughs> you know so sometimes you got to give them these kind of feedback systems. For them to understand that you're right, I don't see in that mode, or I don't, um, I do see my head starting to tilt, and that's probably not a good thing. And then the other side of that is, you know, have them try running down the baseline with their head sideways and see how they do, you know, or or don't have them drive, but Love maybe that. that's great, you know, trying to do certain exercises while their head's tilting and notice that it doesn't work too well. It's not mm. easy. That's so good. No, and one of my questions was how does, because again, so two years ago, I was, I was introduced to Doug Latta. Uh, he, he came on the show and we basically talked two things, which is balance and hand path. And I was like, oh, that's, that's elementary stuff. And people who know Doug know that he works with some of the best players in the world and obviously really good at what he does. And then I started to dig more into, okay, how does balance affect the brain? And it was just like a, a, a light bulb came on for me of, if, if we're not in a balance, in a position of balance and we're not moving, you know, dynamically through a position of balance, then it's going to affect literally everything else that we do. And so I'd, I'd love for you to go a little bit more in depth with that. So just, just being able to, to move through balance and stay balanced. Uh, and how does that just kind of walk through, walk us through how that affects the brain or just is, am I on the right track at least? Well, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it is a, um, you know, it's probably a complex conversation to have. Um, sure. But, but the brain is, you know, its job is this homeostasis survival mode. And if there's disruption or, or violent action or all these, you know, out of balance things, the brain's going, oh, no, what's going on? Mm-hmm. I, need to, I need to change my motor patterns to, to stay in, in, uh, in balance. And so, mm-hmm. you know, Obviously, you know, I think getting in a good position, having a stable base, having a stable eyes, my bias is the eyes can, can control balance. And so if those eyes are tilted or if you're only paying attention to one eye, they're not really, um, you know, maybe a lack of a better word, but they're not anchoring on the, the, on the, um, whatever the target is, the body doesn't know how to orient itself in a sense. Okay. So it's kind of an orient orientation. And when people are in that highly visual state and their eyes are anchored on a good target, the body tends to be in a more stable position. And, you know, whether it's Lotto or even, you know, Reggie Smith, Reggie's got some good demonstrations that he shows that the balance uh, and the and and body could be huge on there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even from from my standpoint, um, you know, we show how vision can throw your balance off if you're not focused. You can be focused 
maybe even eight inches off of the ball at contact, and it can throw your balance out, out of whack on there. So, you know, even, you know, going back backwards a little bit, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, is learning how to see the ball deep is, is huge. And because if the eyes take off, the balance gets out of, out of whack. So people talk about, oh, well, you can't see it the last 10 feet. Now, honestly, Jonathan, I, I could probably have an hour conversation about that and why that's the worst thing to ever tell anyone, okay? okay. But in, in simplicity is the brain can see things quicker than we can pro- we can verbalize, okay? But we are in a better body position when our eyes are at contact than if our eyes are looking down third baseline. And best example I give is, um, for one, I was a place kicker in college. I could not kick a football with my eyes straight up in the air. My eyes always had to be on contact. But there's some demonstrations we can show players that they lose a lot of weakness and a lot of imbalance when their eyes come off that ball. So it plays a huge role, all, all of that. Sure. No, I, I love that. And, and I love getting to hear because I, I feel like with, me, with, with you being like, this is your life, this is, this is what you do on a daily basis. And as baseball coaches, I think we all – we try and, and research as much as we can in the, in the different fields. And we feel like we have uh, hopefully a decent understanding of what we're trying to research and implement. But I, I just, I love, and, and some of the things that, that I used to think I have changed because of your research and, and Dr. Bill's as well, which is a great thing, but I also love getting, getting to hear the thought process. And, and I also, and I really, really like that whenever you have something that's quote unquote old school, but then, we have, you know, technology and, and terminology and, and studies have, that have shown that it, it actually is true, which I think is always a really cool thing. Another yeah. thing that, that I... John, one thing, sure, um, you know, uh, about vision and what we're talking about is the hardest thing is everyone wants the single pill that's going to make these guys see the ball incredible. And some people think you either got it or you don't. But it, it's a system that has to be uh, ingrained or a philosophy that has to be preached to the players. So even though I talk about it from a scientific and a functional and, and testing, it, it's, it's an opportunity that coaches miss just to discuss how, what they're seeing, how they're seeing, and what they're looking for. It's so easy for us as coaches to correct a mechanical flaw because that's the result. That's the, and and we see it externally of what their body's doing. And what we forget is what drove, what drove that result? Was it, he was thinking about his test that he just failed. Is he thinking about his girlfriend, his mom, his, you know, his, his, Mm -hmm. his money. And if he was, was he not focused on the task at hand? Was he not picking that ball up out of the release point? Was he not tracking it really well? And I think that's one of the key components that's missed is a hitter always goes back to the mechanical flaw instead of asking themselves, did I see it like a beach ball? Did, am I capable of seeing it like a beach ball? And if I'm not, how can I get better? And I'm going to rant on this a little bit more. Please do. Part of, part of the problem when it comes to vision is no one wants to be told that they don't see well. When you go to an optometrist to get your eyes checked, you try to pass the test. You don't go in there going, hey, could I see better? Is there a way I can you know, do things? So people don't know they can see better until they, they try, until they work at it. So coaches need to talk, talk the game, learn the language of what were you, you know, simple as what were you looking at? And get these players to start thinking about what they see, not how they feel. No, it's you led right into my next discussion, uh, which is how do we, how do we, I don't want to say make quick fixes, but let's say we're in the middle of a game and a player or even game planning purposes, which uh, let me rewind just a minute. Let's, let's start with game planning. One of the things that I, that I absolutely love with game planning was being able to translate what we think that we're going to see and then how it feels. Because I think that that goes back to 
you know, your leadoff hitter, he gets to see the pitcher, but he sees five or six pitches and then he comes back into the dugout and everybody's asking, Hey, what did you see? What'd you feel like? How did, you know, what did it, what did it look like? And so being able to have a common language within that before the game, I think is super important. So taking, you know, track man data and video and being able to translate that into, you know, a, a, a something that they've seen, but let, let's start with that. And then I want to pivot to, okay, now we're in the middle of a game what are some questions that you would ask them, which you've, you've mentioned a couple, which is what did you see? And, you know, and just kind of letting them go from there, which I, I think it's, it's such a simple question, but it, but it's not. And so what complex question, and there's like five of them in there. So I apologize yeah. for just basically no. spitballing at you, but let's go back yeah. to game planning and, and let, let's talk about that. Honestly, it's a, it's a complex answer, but it's a simple answer too. And, um, you know, I think one of the languages that I would change is I would ask players how well they saw the ball. Not did they see it or not, but how well did they see it? And that's, that's a scalable, you know, grading system. And, and I go like a one through 10 and I don't allow tens. Tens are, are way up there. Those are like rarely ever going to happen, but they need to understand because if you ask a player, did you see it? They're going to say, yeah, I see it. Okay, that's not my point because we can see color, we can see emotion. But how well did you see it? How tuned in were you? And that's a simple thing that that honestly can change at the beginning, but also in the game of just saying, hey, do you see that ball like a five or do you see that ball like a nine? And now you're starting to think about, okay, right, you know what? I didn't see that like I'm capable of. And you, you know, even at going on this, John, is if I saw the ball like a three, does it matter what my swing did? It shouldn't because I didn't give myself a chance to re- respond to uh, the pitch that came. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to backtrack. You talk about the, the, the first batter coming off. And, you know, this is a little hard doing this, uh, you know, virtually and in, in conversation without any right, visuals absolutely. here. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I, we see this all the time. I, I see it in softball a lot. I do see it in baseball. But the person that's on deck is getting ready. And I think there's there's a lot of things visually they can prepare there that they don't. Um, but what they do is the, the batter that's up strikes out. They come out, and the first question they ask him is, what did you see? Now, why do you ask someone who just failed – at their task, what they saw. They obviously were not very successful at what they were doing. And you don't know if they were looking in the right place, you know, when, you know, we do, when where, and how on there. Um, you don't know if they were thinking about something else, but we're trusting them with what we think they might have saw on there. So, for instance, if they come down and say, and, and you've had this happen, Man, that curveball's dropping off the table. So now when I go up to the plate, since I'm in the on-deck circle, I'm looking for this thing dropping off the, the table. And I'm looking for this nasty curveball. And next thing I know, I see a flat curveball. And I don't know what how to pull the trigger because it's not the nasty one I was looking for. And we start being visually creative. We have to all understand how we see. And part of it is, and I know people screw around in the dugout. But it's okay to screw around the dugout. But when the pitcher is getting ready to release the ball, we got to make sure that we're picking up that release point and recognizing what's coming out of there. Now, not everyone can see like Barry Bonds, but Barry used to be able to tell you instantaneously what the pitch was before it even released his hand on there, or at least the pitcher's hand. But we still need to be visually tuned in of picking that ball up early. And if I do that in the dugout and then I do it in the uh, hole – And then I do it in the on-deck circle. Now I'm ready, and I know what the guy throws. I don't have to rely on my neighbor to give me false information. So I think sometimes we get caught up in trying to understand what other people see, but we don't know how they see. So getting information for someone who sees differently is probably not the best thing we, we, we should be doing. That's interesting. I've never thought about it like that. Yeah, it's, you know, if you and I are in the same room and we look at something or we pull the scenery up on the screen right now, 
you and I would have different views of that. We might have different height judgment. We might have different depth judgment. We may be attracted to different colors. We might, we just see things a little bit differently. Now, the guy you you want to ask questions from is the guy who's who's raking, the one who's hitting mm-hmm. rockets. Man, how are you getting this release point? Where do you see that? Uh, you know, what part of the ball are you looking for? Um, you know, what, you know, are you thinking about this? And, you know, just those are the people you want to pick their brain to create your own visual plan. But we all have to have a good visual plan uh, to give ourselves a good chance. Sure. Another thing, and, and one, I want to get into some different drills and some, you know, just some different things that some takeaways that, that the players can have. But I thought that it was really interesting. I can't remember if it was the hitting biomechanics book that, that your, your dad, Dr. Bill, was featured in or somewhere else that I read where it talked about uh, Albert Pujols's reaction time and how just they measured it. I can't remember exactly how they measured it and what devices that they used, but whatever that they used to measure him being in his prime with the St. Louis Cardinals and, and just being all world. They said that his reaction time was equal to that of the average just American at the time, like not just professional baseball, just average American. And so it really got me into trying to dig into more of, okay, so it's not hitting is not just a reaction. And one of the things, one, I'd love for you to, to hit on more on that if, if you would like, but also it, it got me to thinking about how we structure hitting practice. And I, you know, we went from uh, throwing BP a little further back to then bringing it in uh, forward just to create the, the same reaction time that it would with a 90 mile an hour fastball. And so it, it had me rethinking is that good? Is that not good? It, it may be good in some ways, but I think we also need the length to be able to predict and use that predictive vision that you talked about uh, of being able to predict where the pitch is going to be. And so, one, do you want to hit on the Pujols reaction story? And, and you know, if you have anything to add there, but also, is there value in the short BP? And the long BP, which one would you prefer? And and kind of talk to us a little bit about that. <laughs> good good questions. Um, you know, as far as pull holes is concerned, I've never evaluated him, so I don't know all the natural abilities that he has. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know a little bit about philosophically of how he goes about things. Um, I know he's a guy who gets a really good balance. But I also know he's a guy who really trusts his eyes and has a, a visual approach to the game. Um, the I would assume that he's got pretty good visual skills. Um, and when we talk about reaction time, um, you know, it's kind of um, – I, I don't know if I'd call it really fair to say, well, he has great reaction time, that's why he's good. Um, I, there's obviously more to it than just being able to react to something, um, and, and visual, or I should say have accuracy. I, the study that you're, or the thing you're talking about, I haven't read that for a very long time. So I, I'm kind of vague to, um, what that results were on there, but, you know, going back to, uh, one, some of the testing we do and even the S2 cognition, um, yeah, he probably, it would be be pretty cool to see where he sits on on the spectrum of that and you know even if he's at the higher spectrum it still takes more than just scoring on a high spectrum to to be able to perform you got to be able to do it day in day out and it becomes you got to it and that's I kind of saying this you got to have these good eyes or good brain or good body mm-hmm. but it's really about um how you apply it. And there's a, a plenty of players out there that may not have had the best swing, may not have had the best body, uh, may not even have the best eyes on there, but they figured out a way to compete and be successful. And I think that's the, the key thing for all your players is, is they're not all the same. How do we get them to compete at their best? And, you know, I'm biased to the vision side of it, mm-hmm. but it may be something else that triggers them and, and maybe it's anger that gets them to perform at a high level. You, you know, sure. some guys with great vision aren't maybe too choosy because they see the ball so good, 
but really trying to, you know, look at all aspects of these people's game instead of putting them in a, they can't swing or they, or they got this great swing. We got to figure out all these little components that, that make them great on there. Right. I love that. So, so with, with the BP, uh, is, is there value in doing it? Sure. I know that the, when you move it in closer, the representation is different because you don't have the length. And uh, obviously that comes with a lot of different things as far as vision goes. Uh, but, but just trying to, trying to link the perception and action that we see in a game and making it game like, is there still value to moving it in closer to try and create that reaction time or should we st- uh, stay further back and use that use that tr- really trying to figure out the same visual system that we use in a game or should we do both yeah Jonathan it's a really good question that I, I don't know uh, I've thought about many many times and okay. uh, I think you know probably your last statement there's probably value in both and here's the thing it, it, the trajectory and learning to see the whole length is is mm-hmm. awesome is is really good because that's what we want to do is create these visual patterns but it, it's only as good as what the hitter's doing as far as how they're using that so again if i'm looking in the wrong spot or i'm thinking about other stuff and you're thrown from that long distance that value may not be there um unless they're visually tuned in to picking up information and doing that now on the short side uh, the same thing. I think some guys get caught up in swing, 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 and they don't really see the ball like they need to. So I think the the emphasis of looking for the ball, even in the short mode, I think there's value because uh, um, they're kind of at, putting their aiming system in play, putting their brain in play. It all comes down to creating this great confidence and Visual confidence, physical confidence, mental confidence. Um, if, if you're throwing, you know, 95 off the mound to this guy and cutting him up and doing this, you know, you're just you're breaking him down where he has zero confidence. It's not going to translate to the game. So he's a guy that might need shorter throw to create that confidence and build up to get him ready for a game. So I think, again, I, I wish there was a straight answer. I think the best <laughs> like vision training in a sense is getting in the bullpen and tracking with intent. Okay. And unfortunately most people get down there and don't do it with intent. They just kind of get lazy, but get in there. Like they're stepping into the box, get in there with picking up the ball, the release point, tracking it all the way. And then either with these like mule short sticks, you know, they can swing or take if they want Mm -hmm. or, I'm a big fan of stepping out of the box, repicture what they just saw, and then put their result of how they would re- would react to that pitch. They would either take it or they would swing and do okay. that and, and then step back in. So they're not just getting in there just to kind of track. I think that's the problem sometimes with BP is they're trying to do so much. They get away from focusing on that task. They're so worried about results in that situation. So, you know, bouncing around a little bit, we can only focus on really one thing at a time. Mm -hmm. Now we can focus on multiple stuff, but when we do it, it pulls in a sense power from other sources. And it's like, we're not very effective in, in, in limiting our system and trying to spread it out a lot. So Knowing, okay, look, if I'm doing short BP and all I'm worried about is my stride, it might be better to do that short than the large, the the long. Or if I'm worried about my hand path, it might be better at short BP than long BP. But if if I want to really get good at trajectory recognition and seeing the length of a pitch, I'll probably be better at it at a larger distance. Well, that's a great answer to a really, again, a complex question. And sorry, I'm just kind of shotgunning at like all of these different questions because I, I you know, <laughs> I'm excited to get to learn from you. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go through some, some different drills that I, you know, that I've used or that people use for quote unquote vision training. But I, I did want to start with whenever we're talking about perception and action, we do that in a game, like we perceive while we're acting and they both kind of, it's in a cyclical motion, I guess you could say, or, or whatever. 
but they both go together. Whenever we are working on vision or seeing the ball, do we need to be moving? Because I, I, I'm thinking no, for a couple of things. Number one, seeing the ball in a bullpen, would it be better to stride uh, with that and see it? Or should we just be you know, looking at the, pic- uh, at the pitcher uh, and, and trying to find the, the where to look, when to look, and, and how? Or, and also I'm, I'm thinking of, uh, just a, a video training of like looking at videos of pictures on your phone. Would it be better to, to, you know, move with that? It's just, I, I'm trying to link both of them. And I think in an yeah. ideal world you would, but just tell me, is there value in those things without having to do all of it? Because there's going to be some coaches that are limited on space and time. And, and I've been there. I, I, I understand that completely. So is there is there value in in not having to do one hundred percent like game like BP every single day and 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 I, I guess I'm getting off on a tangent here of trying to make everything game like is there value in training our vision without having to do all of it? Definitely, I, I think Jonathan uh, we we do get caught up, but you know the sugar pill still works, and giving them something that makes them feel good is going to work on there okay. now cool. when you go into this bullpen like you asked in the bullpen yeah if i'm in the bullpen track pitches i would try to get as game like as you can you know taking your stride and everything you want but maybe mm-hmm. there's some guys behind the catcher behind back behind that are just work working on switching to the release point mm-hmm. um without the body movement on there so you're getting kind of two things uh you know going in there um, I do think there's there's value um, in visualization and, you know, creating a good visual plan, a visualization of how you approach the game. Now, when it comes to technology and like, uh, you know, watching video, uh, occlusion, um, mm-hmm. VR kind of stuff, um, I have some biases that I don't think those things are good enough right now. I think the technology is going to get better, um, but I don't think they're horrible. They're not going to hurt anyone. There's no, there's not a lot of negativity by doing any of that stuff. Um, there, there's probably if you took ten guys, you know, especially let's say this the VR that a lot of people are, you're probably going to get two or three guys that just going to get some really good value out of it. You're going to get three guys that it's just a waste of time. And four guys that are going to have no clue, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, that's the hard thing about coaching is you've got all these players that that you're trying to to make better, and you want to have a, a general, you know, a system and a philosophy that gets there. But these tools are going to uh, how whatever it's a T, whether it's a video occlusion, whether it's a, um, you know a weighted ball, whatever it is, not everyone's going to get the same value out of that. So that that's the challenge I think as a coach is learning the different kinds of tricks to get those people in that mode that you want them to, to perform at. Cool. No, I love that. Thank you uh, for that. I do have a couple other things uh, that I have mentioned, and then I would love to hear you add some, one, uh, Dr. Bill mentioned, or actually you and, and Calix Crab did, uh, the Barry Bonds drill, which is the over over speed training. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I wish I could find this video. Um, I think it was ESPN at the time. Um, Doc had worked with Barry um, with the Pirates back then. And um, the... Um, and I'm not, I don't know exactly, I can't tell you the whole background, but basically what Barry would do was he would take a jugs um, pitching machine and would, someone would feed that jugs pitching machine and he would take a, left, a glove on his left hand and he would work on tracking the ball as as deep as he could. So he'd try to track it past home plate and, and catch it. And he knew if he could catch it, he could get his bat to it. And so what it really has a little bit to do, and this is what some people struggle with is they want it all to be a hitting drill, but it's really a visual drill of working on seeing the ball as deep and as long as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, we do it and Calix does this a lot now 
Um, I did it with Calix when he was a, a player. Um, we use a wiffle ball machine, the Max BP, that throws a pretty high velocity of a small target. Mm-hmm. And uh, we do a few different, but the one thing we do is we'll use the backhand and we'll work on catching that, tracking it past. They can't catch it in front of their belly button. So they're working on tracking it all the way past their belly button and then catching it as deep as they can on there. So that's one one way that, that we use that kind of drill. Eventually, they can get better where we will use like a stick bat and they can hit it and, and do that. But we want them to see the ball as deep as they can. Is there value in like the because I, I love the max bp machine too and i, I love that that drill and I, I thought that 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 was too good not to share but as i know that that with the there was there was a, a i can't remember what big leaguers there were but i, I think it was somebody with the rangers maybe Wangon gone or pudge or, or somebody that they would they would set up the machine with different colored baseballs or numbers and i don't i don't know if that's still good i like with with some guys, I'm sure it still goes on, but just like I'm thinking, I can't see numbers. Like numbers would just be impossible for me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you have a differing opinion, but like with different colors of just being able to to focus on that, is there value in not necessarily an entire ball that's a different color, but painting like a dot or some <laughs> some sort of very small visual difference in in the balls, uh, at, even if it's like a regular baseball. Uh, and seeing and tracking those in and trying to to pick those up. Yeah, you know, I think uh, also you're missing there is the tennis ball machine was a big big hit. That's what it was. Okay, yeah, I, that was maybe ten or fifteen years ago. But I remember that going and then trying, and I was like, yeah, there's no way I can do this. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, maybe that's why I'm, I'm I'm coaching still. There are some guys that still use it, um, and I here here's the the benefit of it is confidence again. It gives them confidence that they could see something that fast. Now, the there is a little bit of a trick to it, um, and part of it is how we look at our eyes, but I call it the velocitization effect. And anytime we speed something up, we sl- slow the speed up, it, it feels like it's putt-putt. And best example is like driving down a highway that um, – Two lane road, whatever you're driving, you know, 95 miles an hour, maybe. And you come to a small town that you got to go about 40 miles an hour. And it feels like you're going about two miles an hour. Mm -hmm. But by the time you get to the other side of town and you try to get back up to 95, man, now it feels like you're flying up there. And so there's an immediate effect of a slowdown, like how we perceive that visual information um, that can be valuable in a a confidence situation. Now, reading numbers and colors and stuff like that, people have been doing it for years. I am not a huge fan of reading numbers or colors on a ball. And the reason I'm not a fan of it is because it becomes a verbal exercise and people are calling numbers out and calling colors out. Mm -hmm. If I was going to do any kind of drill with that, I would rather have a response drill to a color or to a um, to a number. So whether it's it's red, they're going to pull; blue, they're going to drive the other way. On the same note of this, there is a a if let's say let's say um, I don't know. Let's say green, you're not swinging at. Okay. Okay. If that ball's down the middle. Why are we not swinging at it? That's a good point. You know, so it there. There's kind of some ways. I, it's, again, none of this is going to hurt someone. <laughs> I don't really believe in a hurting someone. It, it only can help people. Mm-hmm. Um, if that gave them the confidence, then then it's worth every single thing they do. Sure. Um, but if I design a drill, I would rather have a decision making movement based off what I'm seeing whether rather than um, just reading trying to read now sure on the other side of things I do do some stuff where uh, they call a number of where it crosses the plate and this again this is not a hitting drill 
This is more of a recognition drill. And they're basically trying to understand where, where things are crossing the plate and give them a visual reference and a visual awareness. So mm -hmm. depending on what that, you know, what we're trying to accomplish, we may add some numbers or even like um, uh, one of the things on a fielding drill is you might use some colored balls uh, or um, colored dot on there or even a number. And what you're really trying to get them to do is not see it when the ball's coming to them, but once it's in their hand, they have to see that number and it forces their eyes to stay through, um, at the contact point of their glove rather than looking up at the runner run. So there, there are some like kind that. of, yeah. to do it. Um, but you just got to make sure what, what am I trying to accomplish when I do those things? Sure. Well, and that's, that's why I wanted to ask you about it. Uh, and, and then I did, I did want to, to see uh, your thoughts on some different drills that, that we should be doing. If you've got anything else, basically I want you to empty out your pockets, but I've, <laughs> I've been really con conscious of trying to make it game like and, and keep that perception action link. And whenever you're, you're mentioning like we, we want to swing at strikes and we want to take balls and get, I don't want to say getting cute, but that's, Sometimes that's what we do with drills. I do that too. We get too cute and we r forget the the action behind it. And so you're talking about, hey, we want to swing at the green balls. Well, we're never going to see green balls in a game. So is that truly linked? And so, you know, it's it, it's always a balance. And and I really, I think that that's really, really good. And I'm glad that, that you made that point. But yeah, let, I did want to ask say, you. Let me add one please, thing though before do. you ask please the do. question. The, the looking at the green ball, there is... The, the value of looking at a color ball is it gives them visual attention. It gives them a target to focus on. And we are lazy human beings. Mm -hmm. And if you just said, look at the ball, they may or may not. But if they said, you know, what's on that ball, they're, they're, they're tuned in a little bit more than they would be. So that's, you know, again, there's Great a point. balance of trying to figure out what are you trying to accomplish and do you want it to be verbal? Do you want it to be an action? Or do you want them to just be aware of something? Oh, that's a great point. Yeah, we're bringing a, a attention to something that that is small. So again, with me trying to figure out, okay, does is this me being cute or is this actually going to help them get better in a game is is always something that that I'm trying to balance too. But that's a great point of the, hey, we're, we're switching it up just a little bit to bring attention to something that we feel like is important that may be lost. So I love that. And, and thank you for making that point. But before you go, I've got to ask, what is like one drill or a few drills that you know are hits with players? Like, you know that, that you've heard from, from multiple sources that players love X drill or X, Y, and Z drill. What are a few of those? One of, one of the one of the things that you mentioned too that I think is is the the different balls on the plate drill. I think that that's that's a very underused one because then one we can see where they think that they're seeing and if it actually lines up because I, I think that that's a really important one. And then I think uh, we mentioned Jeff Rotmayer and one that I that I would like to bring to the table if you don't mind was the letter system for the height. So not only having the balls on the plate, so like the nine ball drill on the plate, then you have, so Jeff, who's a mutual friend of ours, has a pole and he has numbers for like very top of the strike zone, four seam, make you chase pitch to below the knees. So like an A through F scale. And so one of the things that he likes is doing that and then calling out the number, which is one through nine, which I think a lot of us are familiar with, but also a letter for the height. So it's not only in it's in on the plate uh time and space but also height as well which i think is super important and I, I think that he stole that from you guys yeah you know in and in and out is is something that um surprising but not surprising that people do not see very well you know, you'll you'll be shocked when you ask them to call a number out like uh where it's crossing the plate and you they'll say like five and it's a it's a four and um, it, it's kind of a joke in my world is uh, we want to get umpires and coaches talking that language of um, not if that was a strike or not, but where was it? Um, you know, that was a two, that was a three, that was a five. Um, so people understand exactly where it's crossing in and out on the plate. But what most people forget about is the up and down as mm -hmm. well. 
Um, so we got in and out and we got heights. And so what we do with the height one is we either put it on, like set a pole or a T or something and get guys getting understanding of how high that ball's crossing or how low that's crossing. Sure. Um, the third, third level of that is really depth too. So okay. you got in and out, up and down and back and forth as far as depth. Okay. Um, you know, we don't tend to talk to it too much because, um, I mean, I do, but um, getting people to understand the height has been a challenge, <laughs> Jonathan. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know, we, we're, we're trying – they understand in and out, but they need to understand that height as well. And, yeah. you know, it's even great for pitchers, for pitchers to understand where that ball's crossing uh, when it needs – you know, where they want it to cross. So it's a great um, feedback system for the player to understand what's going on. The side benefit of it is they track the ball logger because they're so more focused on where it's coming across the plate. Mm-hmm. They they actually give themselves more time to see it. No, I really like that. And when when and I know we've got to wrap up pretty quickly because you've got to go. But I did uh, I did like it for even just with like uh, for me you call it front toss or flips or whatever you want. Just the underhand toss that players do to each other at least in, in the amateur ranks, and it's like okay, we can set up the balls, we can set up the pole, and then it just takes the focus from something that's really simple, which is flips, uh, to something that's now it's a more focused thing. And and it may not be linked perception and action-wise. It may be used as a warm-up, but it's also, hey, are you seeing the ball uh, in space? But how do you measure the depth one? Is there there something that you put down to be able to do that? Because I'm I'm really curious Uh, about that. Yeah, I mean, even the sometimes we'll use our height one, the A through or the A through J, and we'll lay it mm-hmm. flat down. So okay. now Perfect. you're making, you know, you want that ball at at E, or you want that ball at F, or you want that. So you have the up and down a little bit. Sometimes we we'll use we have what we call contact points that we have uh, little squares, and we'll place those in different spots and say, okay, these are the areas we want you to be able to recognize these. Do not. So you have a green that means go and red that means take. So oh, a lot great. of programs, uh, especially I have a lot of softball programs that are been using it quite a bit, and um, they love the the tools because it get, it creates that new language. Uh, you know, it creates a, a, a process of understanding um, what they can hit and what they can't hit, and it's not about you know, being a striker ball, but it's a ball that, hey, this is a pitch that you're uh, – a two is something that you're going to get good at laying off or two is one you're going to make sure you're hitting it out at A instead of hitting it out at J, you know, kind of thing. So they, they have it's a pretty good common language that they can work together with. I love that, and and I just I, I can't thank you enough for your time. I feel like I I really put you through the ringer today because it's it's there were so many things that you said that were so good and that I wanted just more information about, and and you you did a fantastic job of just really giving us a, a ton of things to think about and to work with. And I, I did want to leave you with this: how do how do listeners get in touch with you? Uh, and leave us with that. And then if there's anything else that you'd like to tell them before you go, uh, the mic is yours. Yeah, well, appreciate it, Jonathan. I appreciate the time. And as you can see, um, it's not just watch the ball. We, we spent uh, over an hour now and probably can spend another five hours talking about this uh, system. And um, But it's it's something that can be – you don't have to know what I know to implement within your program. It's a um, – there's simple steps that they you can take or simple language or or just adjustments to drills that you're doing to add a visual component uh, to those drills, um, even if you don't know if they have great eyes or not. Um, but as far as, you know, where I'm located, I'm located in Southern California. Um, I do travel a lot. Our, my website, slowthegamedown.com. Um, all the social media is at slowthegamedown. Um, Ryan at slowthegamedown.com is an email. We also have another venture called NDV Performance. And NDV Performance is a little bit of an umbrella company that we're working and doing some education and, and virtual team programs. So what we do is, um, you know, we teach the, the emphasis of visual systems to either coaches or to their teams. Um, 
and give them drills and exercises so that they can practice visual skill training, but then also how it applies to their sport. So we'll be launching more of those as we continue. And, um, you know, it's, it's time to take a new look at the game and, and, and understand that, Hey, old school is, is new school and new school is old school. And, and, but if they can't see this object that they're trying to accomplish, uh, it makes it a lot more challenging to be successful. Thank you for listening to Ahead of the Curve. You can subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, which can include Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please share it on social media to help get the word out. Once again, thank you for joining us.